What's next? Lethal autonomous weapons. Lethal autonomous weapons. That means things that can kill you and make their own decision about whether to kill you. Which is the great dream, I guess, of the military industrial complex, being able to create yes. such weapons. So the worst thing about them is big, powerful countries always have the ab ability to invade smaller, poorer countries. They're just more powerful. Mm -hmm. But if you do that using actual soldiers, you get bodies coming back in bags and the relatives of the soldiers who were killed don't like it. So you get something like Vietnam. Mm -hmm. In the end, there's a lot of protest at home. If instead of bodies coming back in bags, it was dead robots, there'd be much less protest and the military industrial complex would like it much more because robots are expensive. And suppose you had something that could get killed and was expensive to replace. That would be just great. Big countries can invade small countries much more easily because they don't have their soldiers being killed. And the risk here is that these robots will malfunction or they'll just be more... No, no. That's, even if the robots do exactly what the people who built the robots want them to do, the risk is that it's going to make big countries invade small countries more often. More often, because they can. Yeah, and it's not a nice thing to do. So it brings down the friction of war. It brings down the cost of doing an invasion. Mm. But, and these machines will be smarter at warfare as well. So they'll be Well, better. even when the machines aren't smarter. So the lethal autonomous weapons, they can make them now. And they, I think all the big defense departments are busy making them. Even if they're not smarter than people, they're still very nasty, scary things. Because I'm thinking that, you know, they could show just a picture, go get this guy. Yeah. And go take out anyone he's been texting. And this little wasp. So two days ago, I was visiting a friend of mine in Sussex who had a drone that cost less than £200. And the drone went up. It took a good look at me. And then it could follow me through the woods. Mm. And it followed. It was very spooky having this drone. It was about two meters behind me. It was looking at me. And if I moved over there, it moved over there. It could just track me mm -hmm. for 200 pounds. But it was already quite spooky. Yeah, and I imagine there's, as you say, a race going on as we speak to who yeah. can build the most complex autonomous, autonomous weapons. There is a, a risk I often hear that some of these things will combine and the cyber attack will release weapons Sure. Um, you, can, you can get combinatorially many risks by combining these other risks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for example, you could get a super intelligent AI that decides to get rid of people. And the obvious way to do that is just to make one of these nasty viruses. If you made a virus that was very contagious, very lethal, and very slow, everybody would have it before they realized what was happening. I mean, I think if a superintelligence wanted to get rid of us, it would probably go for something biological like that that wouldn't affect it. Do you not think it could just very quickly turn us against each other? For example, it could send a warning on the nuclear systems in America that there's a nuclear bomb coming from Russia, or vice versa, and one retaliates. Yeah, I mean, my basic view is there's so many ways in which a superintelligence could get rid of us, it's not worth speculating about. What, what is to well, stop What it? you have to do is prevented ever wanting to. That's what we should be doing research on. There's no way we're going to prevent it from... It's smarter than us, right? There's no way we're going to prevent it getting rid of us if it wants to. We're not used to thinking about things smarter than us. If you want to know what life's like when you're not the apex intelligence, ask a chicken. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of my dog Pablo, my French bulldog, this morning as I left home. He has no idea where I'm going. He has right. no idea what I do. Right. I can't even talk to him. Yeah. And the, the intelligence gap will be like that. So you're telling me that if I'm Pablo, my French bulldog, I need to figure out a way to make my owner not wipe me out. <laughs> yeah. So we have one example of that, which is mothers and babies. Evolution put a lot of work into that. Mothers are smarter than babies, but babies are in control. And they're in control because the mother just can't bear lots of hormones and things. But the, babe, the mother just can't bear the sound of the baby crying. Not all mothers. Not all mothers. And then the baby's not in control and then bad things happen. We somehow need to figure out how to make them not want to take over. The analogy I often use is 
forget about intelligence, just think about physical strength. Suppose you have a nice little tiger cub. It's sort of a bit bigger than a cat. It's really cute. It's very cuddly, very interesting to watch. Accept that you better be sure that when it grows up, it never wants to kill you. Because if it ever wanted to kill you, you'd be dead in a few seconds. And you're saying the AI we have now is the tiger cub? Yep. And it's growing up? Yep. So we need to train it as it's when it's a baby. Well, now a tiger has lots of innate stuff built in, so you know when it grows up. It's not a safe thing to have around. But lions, people that have lions as pets, yes. sometimes the lion is affectionate to its creator, but not to others. Yes. And we don't know whether these AIs... We, we simply don't know whether we can make them not want to take over and not want to hurt us. Do you think we can? Do you think it's possible to train I superintelligence? Don't I don't think it's clear that we can. So I think it might be hopeless. But I also think we might be able to. And it'd be sort of crazy if people weren't extinct because we couldn't be bothered to try. If that's even a possibility, how do you feel about your life's work? Because you were... Yeah. Um, it sort of takes the edge off it, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the idea is going to be wonderful in healthcare and wonderful in education and wonderful... I mean, it's going to make call centres much more efficient. Though one worries a bit about what the people who are doing that job now do. It makes me sad... I don't feel particularly guilty about developing AI like 40 years ago because at that time we had no idea that this stuff was going to happen this fast. We thought we had plenty of time to worry about things like that. They, when, you, when you can't get the AI to do much and you want to get it to do a little bit more, you don't worry about this stupid little thing is going to take over from people. You just want it to be able to do a little bit more of the things people can do. It's not like I knowingly did something thinking, this might wipe us all out, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. But it is a bit sad that it's not just going to be something for good. So I feel I have a duty now to talk about the risks. And if you could play it forward and you could go forward 30, 50 years and you found out that it led to the extinction of humanity, and if that does end up being, <laughs> being the outcome... Well, if you played it forward and... You it led to the extinction of humanity, I would use that to tell people, to tell their governments that we really have to work on how we're going to keep this stuff under control. I think we need people to tell governments that governments have to force the companies to use their resources to work on safety. And they're not doing much of that because you don't make profits that way. One of your, your students we talked about earlier, um, I Ilya? Yep. Ilya left OpenAI... And there was lots of conversation around the fact that he left because he had safety concerns. Yes. And he's gone on to set, set up an AI safety company. Yes. Why do you think he left? I think he left because he had safety concerns. Really? He, um, I still have lunch with him from time to time. Oh, his, okay. His parents live in Toronto. When he comes to Toronto, we have lunch together. He doesn't talk to me about what went on at OpenAI, so I have no inside information about that. But I know Ilya very well. And he is genuinely concerned with safety. So I think that's why he left. Because he was one of the top people. I mean, he was... He was probably the most important person behind the development of um, ChatGPT. The, the early versions, like GPT-2, he was very important in the development of that. You know him personally, so you know his character. Yes. He has a good moral compass. He's not like someone like Musk who has no moral compass. Does Sam Altman have a good moral compass? We'll see. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know, Sam, so I don't want to comment on that. But from what you've seen, are you concerned about the actions well, that they've taken? Because if you know you Ilya, and Ilya's you, a good guy and he's left. <laughs> that would give you some insight, yes. It would give you some reason to believe that there's a problem there. And if you look at Sam's statements some years ago, he sort of happily said in one interview, um, this stuff will probably kill us all. That's not exactly what he said, but that's what it amounted to. Now he's saying you don't need to worry too much about it. And I suspect that's not driven by seeking after the truth. That's driven by seeking after money. Is it money or is it power? Yeah, I shouldn't have said money. It's some, some combination of those, yes. Okay, I guess money's a proxy for power, but I am, I've got a friend who's a billionaire and he is in those circles. 
And when I went to his house and had uh, lunch with him one day, he knows lots of people in AI, building the biggest AI companies in the world. And he gave me a cautionary warning across the across his kitchen table in London, where he gave me an insight into the private conversations these people have, not the media interviews they do where they talk about safety and all these things, but actually what some of these individuals think is going to happen. And what do they think is going to happen? It's not what they say publicly. No. You know, one one person who I sh- shouldn't name, who is the who is leading one of the biggest AI companies in the world, he told me that he knows this person very well, and he privately thinks that we're heading towards this kind of dystopian world where we have just huge amounts of free time, we don't work anymore, and this person doesn't really give a fuck about the harm that it's going to have on the world. And this person, who I'm referring to, is building one of the biggest AI companies in the world. And I then watched this person's interviews online. Trying to figure out which of three people it is. <laughs> yeah, well, it's one of those three people. <laughs> okay. And I watched this person's interviews online, and I, I reflect on the conversation that my billionaire friend had with me, who knows him, and I go, fucking hell, this guy's lying publicly. Like, he's not yeah. telling the, the truth to the world. And that's haunted me a little bit. It's part of the reason I have so many conversations around AI on this podcast, because I'm like, I don't know if they're... I think they're a li- some of them are a little bit sadistic about power. I think they they like the idea that they will change the world, that they will be the one that fundamentally shifts the world. I think Musk is clearly like that, right? He's such a complex character that I don't I don't really know how to place Musk. Um, He's done some really good things, like um, pushing electric cars. That was a really good thing to do. Yeah. Some of the things he said about self driving were a bit exaggerated, but he. That was a really useful thing he did. Giving the Ukrainians communication during the war with Russia. Starlink, um, yeah. That was a really good thing he did. There's a bunch of things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's also done some very bad things. So coming back to this point of the possibility of destruction and the motives of these big companies, are you at all hopeful that anything can be done? to slow down the pace and acceleration of AI? Okay, there's two issues. One is, can you slow it down? Yeah. And the other is, can you make it so it will be safe in the end? It won't wipe us all out. I don't believe we're going to slow it down. Yeah. And the reason I don't believe we're going to slow it down is because there's competition between countries and competition between companies within a country, and all of that is making it go faster and faster. And if the US slowed it down, China wouldn't slow it down. Does Ilya think it's possible to make AI safe? I think he does. He won't tell me what his secret source is. I'm not sure how many people know what his secret source is. I think a lot of the investors don't know what his secret source is, but they've given him billions of dollars anyway because they have so much faith in Ilya, which isn't foolish. I mean, he was very important in AlexNet, which got object recognition working well. He was the main the main force behind the things like GPT-2, which then led to ChatGPT. So I think having a lot of faith in Ilya is a very reasonable decision. There's something quite haunting about the guy that made and was the main force behind GPT-2, which led rise to this whole revolution, left the company because of safety reasons. He knows something that I don't know (laughs) about what might happen next. Well, the company had... Now, I don't know the precise details, um, but I'm fairly sure the company had indicated that it would, it would use a significant fraction of its resources of the compute time mm-hmm. for doing safety research, and then it kept, then it reduced that fraction. I think that's one of the things that happened. Yeah, that was reported publicly. Yes. Yeah. 